Hello and welcome to our final Subbench Friday. This is Electoral Dysfunction. Hi, Ruth. Hi, Beth. I'm very excited. We are very excited about our latest sub from Jess's bench. Now, we'll hear from her in a second, but you might be able to guess who this person is based on what we're talking about this week. With five weeks of campaigning done, we'll talk about the standout moments from the party, what's actually cut through in real life. Also, as we're expecting a horde of new MPs in just a week's time, how do you deal with suddenly being in the public eye? Is anyone having a guess yet? And after the final head-to-head leaders debate, we'll talk just about just how different it is to interview politicians on daytime TV, as opposed to those flagship news programmes, those big daytime TV shows that are must-do for campaigns for lots of reasons. But let's first hear from Jess. Hi everyone, we are getting close to the finish line and whilst I think in the first voice note that I did, I said that it was raining and I was getting sick of the rain, I am now sweltering to death on the campaign trail. So the person who is going to replace me today is, I believe, for the first time, we are allowing a man to come on our podcast we will not make a habit of such a thing however I think we can definitely on this occasion make an exception this is a man who is politically engaged sometimes gets told that he uh, shouldn't be and we should be keeping the politics with the politicians and to that I say nonsense I love this man with all my heart have done various different things with him over the years and it is always good fun and i'm going to say insightful so i hope you enjoy his political views well i would like to welcome someone that not just jess loves with all their heart but so do ruth and i and so do millions of you out there welcome rylan Hello, gorgeous. Oh, my God. <laughs> just called me gorgeous. You look absolutely beautiful. I've got to say as well, like, I've got my camera on. You saw me all fine. And it is that hot today in my studio that the camera is steaming up and I'm in a vest. So, basically, today we've got Rylan, a steamy Rylan in a vest on. Thanks for having me. This, this I'm a big fan your, of the show. This isn't your two first loving, though, is it? Because you had a little bit of an online loving when Beth was screeching like a harridan at cabinet ministers behind now, her. Now, Ruth, you, you, don't, you don't understand. Like, if <laughs> I, am, I am obsessed with politics. And it was really, it all came about for me when Brexit happened. I used to have Sky News on, BBC Parliament, things like that. And just have that, that was what was on in my house, on every screen, all the time. And from that, I sort of learned, 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 learned. And then obviously we went through the pandemic. And Beth Rigby being that Bob, it literally got people through the panty D. I'm going to say it now. She's always just been so great with the way she asked the questions. And then, yeah, a few few weeks ago when um, the election was called Beth Outside Number 10, screaming like a banshee. I was like, this woman deserves a damehood. I don't know about that, but we have got the clip. I think they've got the clip, Ryland. Should we relive it? Yes, please. Are you looking forward to the election? Can you win it? Can you win it? <laughs> I mean, all that's missing is two for a pound, two know. for a pound. Come on, get, get your green grouse in, goods here, two that's for a pound. No fear, no fear, Rigby. <laughs> love it. Oh. Can you win it? Can you win it? Best thing ever. Honestly, you just take a really like mundane moment and make it hilarious. I, but I did. I mean, it wasn't intentional, but I'm glad you enjoyed it. I'm very glad you were watching us. I felt really made up about that. What I loved about that clip was that you you were actually being interviewed at the time by Sophie Ridge, who's yeah. always so kind of like Ridge. demure. She she looks like she should be permanently in a Lenore advert, like floating through a field in like a like a big long maxi dress, just touching eat corns of wheat and all that sort of stuff. And you're like, can you win it? Go on then. Do you think you're hard enough? I but know. That's literally just... what it is, and that's why I love it. That's why I love there it. There is a reason we do that. All right, not not necessarily in the moment when you're live on television, but when you make a television piece for the evening news, 
part of the thing about shouting at them as they go into number 10 or stuff, we use it as clips in packages in TV reports to tell a story, right? So I've got so conditioned into doing it. But I can tell you, when I first started and I was chasing cabinet minister down Whitehall. Of course she was. And I was off camera and I dropped my phone, right? But because I just started on telly, I didn't realise if I wasn't physically on camera that I could still be heard. Yeah. So I went, oh shit, I've dropped my phone on yeah, live fine. on television, <laughs> right? And then Adam Bolton went, uh, I'm sorry if you heard a member of the public swear. Well, it was so obviously <laughs> me. That was the first and last time I ever swore on telly, touch wood. Oh, well, I wish I could say the same. I mean, you're sitting there worrying about saying the word shit on live TV in the background. Babe, That's it's not that important. The important <laughs> thing is who's running the country. And Rylan, let's talk about the campaign. So you've been following it. I have, yeah. There's a standout star, definitely. What have been your cut-through moments? Ed Davey getting a makeover on this morning killed me. <laughs> Absolutely killed me. I, I literally... Do you know when you have one of those fever moments where you turn the television on and every morning I'll always have the news on and then I'll move on to, like, daytime TV just in the background, see what's going on. And um, I just... I remember making a coffee and hearing, right, our next model is uh, Ed. Uh, Ed's um, the leader of the Lib Dem. I was like, what? What? And I just turned around. It's like Ed Davey walking out like he was having a day at Ascot. I just, I was. <laughs> he looked so proud of himself. Like yeah, but, he was so but happy. You know what? Wait, Ruth, let's be honest, right? We know it's Keir and Rishi, and obviously Nigel's thrown in now and all the others. But the thing is with Ed, he's actually given me giggles throughout, you know, going past <laughs> on the boat, doing a little makeover on, on this morning. Like he's, he's made me laugh falling off the paddleboard. I'm like, these are the moments that people are actually going to be talking about. And does Linda come round? Did you watch? Do you watch the, the debates time. with Linda? Oh, all the time. She's like, I can't get rid of her. She's just been here. I've had to just throw her out because I'm doing this. I'm almost like politics for dummies. That's that's my job when it comes down to say my mum going, what does that mean? Or well, why is why is that happening? And are we going to, oh, I don't know what I'm going to vote for. Blah, 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 all this. I always think like politics, the way it's done, quite a lot of the time, and this is not you guys included. But as we've seen with the election campaign, when you have the runners and riders all there just to answer a question and it goes around and around and yeah. around, the spin of it is just always something. It's comedy. Like I've said before, like my favourite reality show is BBC Parliament on a Wednesday <laughs> because <laughs> it is, it's comical. You know, the, it's like, are you all right, sir? Do you need a lozenge? Like it's... <laughs> <laughs> it's ridiculous just how it all kicks off. Do you sit and watch Prime Minister's yes. Questions on a Wednesday? I love PMQs. I oh, love God. PMQs. And if I'm in the car, I watch it on the Sky app. Do you want me to take you in one day? I've, do you know what? I would love just to be there. It is quite unusual to sit and watch PMQs if you yeah. don't have to. I mean, I admire you for it. <laughs> Where did it come from, do you think? It came from that Brexit era. I didn't understand what it meant. And there was two things as a normal person walking down the street was thinking, can I still use the E-gates and will I get cheaper aftershave at the airport? Those were the two things I was concerned about, and I know a lot of people were. From them two silly points, I then started to really get into sort of the crux of Brexit and trying to understand it. And that's when I just started to sit there and think, why are so many people continuously lying? Like, what? we're not silly, but I think as the masses, we sometimes feel, well, we can't change it. So let, let, it, let it just go on. Don't matter who you vote for. Put a cross in any box. Don't vote. Whatever you think. But as, as the more of it's gone on, if someone like me, you know, I come from a working class background. I left school at 16. I've not got a PhD in politics or anything like that. But if someone like me can sort of self-educate myself to go, well, actually, what X is saying about that tax, they're not saying that they're going to bring in that tax, but they're not ruling it out is the way that they're speaking about that. So it, it's things like that that I started to understand a lot more. And so when my mum comes around, for instance, and she's like, oh, what's going on now? I'm like, well, actually, he's calling him a liar. He's not technically lying, but it's just like learning. I call it politics for dummies. I think, it's, I think everyone should have a little politics for dummies course. But you talked about people also feeling like they can't, affect change or that it doesn't yeah. matter if they tune into it yeah. they're not going to get a straight answer and they can't change anything yeah. and I, I go around the country a lot and I get this repeatedly 
when I talk to people as well. Where do you think the disillusionment comes from? What, what Do you think it is just because people think they can't affect change? Yeah, I think so. Look, I'm not silly in the fact that I know if enough people want something to happen, it will happen. But at the same time, I just think there's been so many false promises over the years from pretty much all the parties, to be perfectly honest, that have, have, have had the power or been in a coalition. And I think it's just getting a little bit tireless and restless now to the point where people go, well, I'm voting for a lesser of two evils, potentially. And there doesn't seem to be a candidate or a party that I feel really represents what I believe, personally, is right for this section and right for that section. So, I mean, there's so many things we could talk about here. We could talk about trans rights. We could talk about um, the cost of living crisis. We could talk about minimum wage. We could talk about disability allowance. We could talk about all of those things. But there isn't one party for me that I'm going, oh, that's tick, 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 tick for me. And I'm just getting to this point, and it's completely outlandish and crazy. But hear me out. I feel now or very soon is the time for partyless politics. I think now what we need to do is abolish these parties, get rid of all of this, get rid of the reds, get rid of the blues, get rid of the greens, get rid of the yellows, get rid of everything, but keep the House of Commons. And anyone that wants to be an MP can run to be an MP. Between the MPs, there's an internal pool of the 300 and odd of them that then decide the top six or top 10 people that they want to run the country between them. And then a prime minister is selected. That prime minister, out of everyone in the House of Commons, can then decide who they want to be on their cabinet. But I just feel like when we're seeing these election debates between Rishi and Kia, especially, it's just tit for tat, tit for tat, tit for tat. What if we eradicated all of that? What happens if Rishi and Kia work together? Like, what happens if them two, let's say one of them got into power and Rishi was on Kia's uh, cabinet? Uh, Keir was on Rishi's cabinet. Potentially, Nigel was involved in this cabinet with X, Y, Z. Or if Ruth was there, you know, all of these. What would happen? Why can't we have the crack team? Why can't we have the power rangers of government all working <laughs> together to make a better country? I just don't understand it. I understand it's laws and it's historical and all of that. But fuck me, it ain't working, is it? Let's be honest. Ruth, what do you think of the idea of doing away with party politics it's sort of like what Ryland's talking a bit reminds me of like a wartime government where all the parties kind of collapse and come together in a national interest like does it have some appeal that actually people are disillusioned with politics we've got a political system where you vote but for many people it doesn't make a difference because you're in a safe seat so you can't change your, your politician even if you you want to vote for a different party I mean has he got a point I think there's a huge appeal to that and I think a couple of things that we've seen happen, and, and in Scotland we've seen it happen twice. So mm. um, Ryland was turned on by the Brexit debate and got himself really engaged in politics because of that. We saw that in Scotland with the independence debate, and then also there was like that secondary yeah. wave when Brexit came a couple of years after. And that really did engage people that weren't involved in party politics at all because it was an issue. It made some things in politics, I think, worse because when you have a big question and you've only got two answers that you can possibly have, it becomes tribal because you're pushing people into tribes. But it did turn people on. So we saw in Scotland, that the referendum was the highest turnout of any electoral event ever, ever. And I think one of the other things that that did was it got people really frustrated too because they got annoyed that there were no uncontested facts. So they got into the debate on independence or Brexit or whatever and be like, yeah, but what's the truth? What's the facts yeah. here? There's two sides shouting at each other using the same data, but they're saying different things about it. And yeah. they're like, and, and who's lying and who's telling the truth? And, and that idea that there wasn't like, somebody somewhere that would come along and just say, this guy's lying, this guy's telling the truth, this is what it actually is. Well, you can't do that in the House of Commons. So, you get so out. immensely, what the fuck? yeah. Yeah, it's so immensely If someone's sitting there saying the sky is red, and we all know the sky is blue, whatever, silly, you know, example, but if I was to stand up and go, sorry, sir, that's a lie, I then have to retract that or be asked to leave. This yeah, you system... can't use the word lie, but you can use you why can not? use a lot of euphemisms unadjacent to the truth. But why talking not? out your behind? But <laughs> I, why I don't know. not? Procedure. When someone is lying, they should be called out. I think this idea that fewer and fewer people 
don't hold with political parties anymore. They care about issues. Mm. It's completely true. And the way in which we do yeah. politics has changed because of social media. So you find people yeah. who believe what you believe on each individual interest and, and, and issue. Bruce, and you, you just care less. now on the head so much. People are caring less about parties and more about policies. You know, I'm not one of these like, oh, you know, dress made of wheat, as you said, like, oh, let's all like be happy together and work together. And it'll be like you're skipping down the street. No, it's not. We're, we're living in a world where unfortunately terrible things are happening. But surely, I mean, I watch, like I say, when I watch Parliament and PMQs, I sit there and go, she'd be a great Home Secretary. He'd be great in charge of the Treasury. That person there would be so great at education. That person there would be so good. And all of them are from different places. And I just think, maybe let's just, you know, like a little bit of like a Big Brother All-Stars series where we just throw in the ones <laughs> that we think... These were all very good housemates. Let's just leave them in charge for a year and see how it goes. The problem is that to change it, you'd have to get MPs to vote for it and, and turkeys never vote for Christmas. So, you know, once they get into power, they'll say, oh, we don't want to change the electoral system. Because, you know, your arguments point as well, I think, to having a different version of voting in which people feel like what, that their vote counts more, right? Yeah. One of the big issues is like this idea that you'd pick the best from each uh, and they would form the government and you'd still have the parliament for everybody else, but you would have the executive that were picked yeah. from all these parties and they would do the best policies taken from each of the manifestos. But who decides what the best is? Because what happens if it's the people that you don't like enacting the policies that you hate from all of the different parties? Mm. That's rather than the, rather than the opposite of that, instead of the people that you do like, the level of dissatisfaction with political parties, not just in this country, but, but yeah, in lots of countries. Across the world, yeah. Means that that distance where the people feel that they're not listened to, they're not represented, that there's mm. a gap between the people who are led and the people who are leading, et cetera, et cetera. That creates the conditions for the rise of uh, nationalists, for strongmen, yeah. for autocrats, yeah. and that's how it's always happened. Yeah. So, so I think there is an incumbency on political parties, the established parties, to, to work harder, to do more, to connect better, because that gap will always be filled. But also, Ryland, you are unusual in the well, you're, you're unique in many ways, but also you have a massive following of younger people, but you're very engaged in politics. You're exactly the kind of person, actually, that can talk to parts of uh, the audience out there that old ladies like me, despite my great makeup, uh, might be <laughs> unable to re to reach. Like, how else do you think that politics can engage with with more disillusioned people, with younger people, better? Like, for example, do you think it would be better to let sixteen year olds vote? I mean, I, I'm a little bit torn on that. I, I think the argument there is there are a lot of sixteen year olds out there that are very headstrong and know what's right and what's wrong. There are also a lot of 16-year-olds out there that aren't. But then saying that, there are also a lot of 48-year-olds out there that aren't. So I think the voting age probably should stay the same. But I think what people need to do is, especially the parties, I think they need to start realising that the generation that is going to keep those in power are the younger generation more than, than the older generation. But this whole generation gap that everyone talks about, it's not really that big. For anyone in power, I don't envy them because it's always going to be hard to please everyone. But I do think younger voters are ultimately going to be the ones affected most by by the change that could have about to happen. You could become like a gateway, a Ryland gateway, matching up <laughs> politics well, Beth, like, with people. That. I'll just, a Ryland I'll gateway. Just become PM. You just become PM. I'd look lovely at that lectern. Would you seriously consider being a politician one day? If I wasn't in the job that I was in, um, I would love nothing more. Look, I lay there at night sometimes and I think about Zelensky. I think about people like that. You know, he played the prime minister. He hosted one of the same shows I've hosted in Ukraine. Like, you know, it's crazy to think that you could do something, go, oh, this would be a laugh and, and see what happens. And the next thing you know, you're leading your country through a war. So Look, nothing's ever off limits. I don't ever sit there and say, yeah, I'm going to run and, and be a politician. But I want to be able to sit there and say, oh, if I was running the country, things would be much better. But you don't know unless unless you're in that position. And I think it's silly for anyone to sit there and say, this country will be better off with me running it. Because until you're running it, you don't know what you're going to run into. So, yeah, I would, I'd never rule it out. You know, there might come a day where I want to hang up the... Uh, 
where I want to hang up the veneers and the fake Oh, my tan. God, they're all going to be phoning you now, mate. My biggest decision would be what lectern am I going to choose? Just keep the hot lectern guy yeah, that is you're... the same guy that always comes out and props it up. Oh, my God. He, can, he 100% can stay. Hot lectern guy, honestly. He it's um, stay. Oh, actually, I probably shouldn't ask this, but do you think do you think there are any handsome politicians? Who do you think is kind of nice looking? Am I allowed to ask you that? Oh, well, you don't have to answer. You can that. ask me that. I don't mind you asking me that. Um, yeah, I do. I do think there are a couple of handsome politicians i think there's a lot of beautiful women politicians actually the sad thing is though it don't matter how you look it's about what you do with it so that's the trouble that i have yeah you care what they're doing with the with the job well look we've got to take a quick break so let's go to a break rylan you have talked a few times about fame coming very suddenly at you uh, from The X Factor. Now, you've got a new podcast called How to Be in the Spotlight. Politics might be less glamorous than top telly, but... Well, I don't know. I won't go that far. What's... <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, it's not as glamorous as it looks, is it? But what's your top tips for someone standing in this election that's going to come into the public eye and everyone's going to want to know everything about them and watch their every move? What's your advice? I think the best piece of advice, I've got given the best one, I've got two pieces of advice. One, and this is going to be a proper name drop, was from the gorgeous Barbara Windsor. I was in um, in a shop buying some underwear and I felt a little tug on my back and turned around and looked down and it was Barbara Windsor. Hello, darling. I went, hello, Babs. I see, I gave her a kiss. I'd seen her a few weeks before on X Factor. She'd come on the panel and um, she introduced me to her husband, Scott. And I went, oh, Scott's so lovely to meet you. She went, no, he was there a couple of weeks back at X Factor. Obviously, I just didn't remember at the time. And I went, oh, sorry, Scott. Like, my, my brain's all over the place. And she went, let me tell you, always nice to see you. Never nice to meet you because you probably already met the bastard. And I tell you what, mm. that has probably saved my shows when I've bumped into a commissioner that I don't even know who it is. And I'm like, so lovely to see you. Like, oh, yeah, you remember me from the, that thing 28 years ago or whatever. And I'm like, yeah. So that's my first piece of advice. Yeah. Always nice to see you. Never nice to meet you. Yeah. And my second piece of advice would be every single person makes mistakes. I make mistakes on a yeah. daily basis. It's every single one does. It's not about the mistake that you make. It's about apologising for it and making mm. it right and moving on. Also, the other thing that I have noticed you've talked about a lot, because, you know, I don't mean to sound stalkery, but I do listen to a lot of the stuff you do, like in a, in a positive way, not a strange way, honestly. Ruth, do you know anyone who can get an injunction? <laughs> get her an ass ball, get her an ass ball. The thing that really sticks in my mind is like, Treat everyone how you want to be treated and be nice to people on your way up because you don't know what's happening when you're coming down. And I think that that is like a life lesson for everyone. Don't often, I don't always meet the moment with that, but I try my best. It's important. No, I think you've got to remember it? as well when you're at the top as well to still do that. Tell me about your podcast, How to Be in the Spotlight. Yeah, so this follows obviously my um, How to Be a Man series I did last year. This time we've come back and it's it's all about how people deal with being in the spotlight. They might have had falls, really great highs. I speak to 10 stereotypical people of how they got famous and sort of the, the highs and lows of it and what they would change and, and just how they put up with it, to be honest. One thing that struck me about what you've talked about, about being famous is like how you, when you kind of go out, it's like you can't be anonymous. Like once you're really famous, you can't be anonymous again. Like if I take my lipstick off, as long as I don't squawk, right. like as long as I don't speak with my big gobby gob Can you win gob, it? Can you win it? Can you win it? No one knows who I am because like once I take my makeup off, I just don't... Beth, I'd know who you were from behind. In yeah, the only, only if I'm way. squawking at <laughs> you. But like I can like go back to my normal life, right? Because I'm not really famous like you are. Yeah, but Beth, I don't look at myself. I don't look at myself like that. But, no, but I'm right, just like your level of right. fame is mental. If I'm, being, if I'm being completely honest, I hate it because, you know, I am a normal bloke. I, yeah, I do a bit of a different job. That's the only difference between me and Ryland that works in Sainsbury's, you know? Like, it, the only difference is I work on telly, you work in Sainsbury's with the same person. Um, I'm very lucky at my job and I'm very lucky at what I've got and I work hard at it. But, yeah, you know, sometimes, like we spoke about earlier, you know, you can... I could put one foot slightly to the left rather than the right and, oh my God, it's a pylon or, you know, people people are out to get something from you and stuff like that. And it's like, 
guys, like, I'm human. Like, and this is what I go back to about mistakes and that. I live every day, like, thinking, what am I going to do today that's going to piss someone off? Can I ask you something? When I started in politics, I had a partner and then we split up and then I had some really low moments thinking that I would never meet anyone again because I couldn't go on dating apps, couldn't do any of that. Like I was the only yeah. openly gay yeah, um, I hear that. political leader anywhere in the UK. Like, like it would be all over the front page of the news if I put up a, a Tinder profile or something like that. I just didn't know how to meet new people without them assuming that I was the same person that they saw shouting at you know another politician on a Thursday or or was in the papers and and you never quite feel as if there's a true representation of you on the media and like how how do you cope with that? Uh, not very well, to be fair. If you want the honest answer, you know my real name's Ross. It's not Rylan, and I am very much Ross ninety percent of the time and Rylan ten percent of the time. But Rylan's my job. It's the same person but just a different version. You know, people probably expect me to be sat indoors in black skinny shit, lanky jeans with the tightest t-shirt on watching reruns of Steps concert in 2002, which sometimes I do. But in reality, I'm sitting watching the Euros with a Peroni in a pair of tracksuit bottoms, with, like with me and Dan trousers, like having a drink. <laughs> like, you know, it's just comfortable. I'm actually, I'm actually a boy, which I think people forget as well. So... You know, it is hard. Like, I'm still single, Ruth. Like, I know you're not. But yeah, I'm still single. I've been three years single now. And I'll be completely honest with you. Oh, I'm fucking bored of it. I am so bored of it. You know, the day in and all that. It is harder than it used to be. And it goes back to me having this thing in my head, which sadly, nine times out of ten is true. People always wanting something from you. They don't just want you. They want something from you. And, you know, Ruth, you, you, you get that as well. You know, being a political leader, being a gay woman as well trying to being being all of a sudden single i have thought when i always thought growing up I imagine being known like as in famous and single god i bet you could get with anyone you wanted to it is the complete fucking opposite it is trust it is this it is that and you know one day i'd like to meet someone of course i would but yeah, of course, I'd like to come home and have a little cuddle at night. But, you know, if either of you two ain't doing anything, come round. I'll come and give you we'll a give cuddle. give you a cuddle anytime. I can say with complete confidence that you will meet someone lovely. I, I'm sure yeah, I will one will. day. You will. One day. And if you know anyone, swing them my way. I want to, Karen, but we're about to run out of time and you've got places to go and people to see. But I want to ask you one more thing because I can't let you go without talking about different styles of TV interviews because... Uh, we saw Keir Starmer on this morning, this week as well. Right. And you, Rylan, interviewed the Prime Minister in January on this morning. What was I what did. was that like for you? Absolutely fine. You know, I was expecting all that, oh, you know, well, look at Rylan interviewing the Prime Minister, which I get and I couldn't give a fuck. But, you know, I asked the questions that I want to know. I asked the questions that also I'm allowed to ask as well. You've got to remember I'm not a uh, Beth Rick B in the 10 Downing Street briefing room. You know, I'll treat anyone the same. I treat every single person the same. If you're the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom or you're on because you fell over down a pothole when you're trying to sue the council, like, I will treat you both exactly the same, which is why during that, Rishi had walked into the studio when we were in the cookery arm. I was like, come over, come and have a bit. Like, you know, and he did, like, don't care. So, you know, everyone's human at the end of the day. I'll speak to everyone exactly how I'd expect to be spoken to. I'll bet you 100% he was more worried and more nervous about being interviewed by you yeah. than the other way around because it's the daytime yeah. ones that catch yeah. you out as a politician they are always the ones that catch you out you're you're harder to be interviewed by because you'll ask different types of questions that they are not primed to do yeah uh, and number two you asked exactly what i would have asked he was going our oh, inflation has halved and the economy is going you're like yeah but when's the election eh when is yeah. it so you did yeah. uh, you did what i would have done anyway i just hope whatever happens whichever party takes power or whichever parties take power, we don't know what's going to happen, that they just do a good job of running this country and they look after the people of this country, all people, not just certain groups of people. Thank you so much for joining us. And my only question is, are you and Linda going to watch election night together? Oh, she'll be in bed by eight. Well, she... <laughs> yeah. Okay, but you'll be watching it, so I'll be thinking about I you. I won't sleep that night. I won't sleep that night. 
Well, I'll be. Ruth and I will be on. I'll be. Yeah, I'll be up all, all night so watching we're you. We're on the Sky One. I'll be watching you. What's that, me? You can can channel yeah. running commentary through us if you'd like. I love it. Thanks so Thank much you for so joining much, us. Guys. It was a pleasure. It was a joy. Well, look, Rylan uh, has had to go because he's got, you know, many fabulous things to do today. He was so good. But before we go, Ruth, on Tuesday, you showed us the battle scars you've picked up from letterboxes. Our listeners have had some thoughts. I mean, lots of thoughts. Who oh, wow, okay. that this would light a touch paper for the nation? And we've had so many messages of advice, which has literally given me life, uh, including this voice note from Postman Matt. I've got a tip for leafleting. If you gently fold your leaflet in half with your fingers in the middle and push it through, if there's an unexpected dog, he'll get the leaflet instead of your fingers. Nice. Thanks, Matt. That's a pro, isn't it? I've got more advice for you, Ruth. Loads of people say that they take wooden spatulas to put in the middle of the leaflet. So you've got about a week to try that one, Ruth. Maureen says she always does it with her slimming wild leaflets. And look, Patrick, let me just tell you this one as well. Patrick sent us a picture of a letterbox to say it's not only dogs to watch for when leafleting. The plaque on the door says, beware, tropical spiders. Please shut the letterbox. No. I mean, if, I mean, if I saw that plaque, I would not even post a leaflet in there. Maybe he doesn't have tropical spiders. Maybe that's just a very devious way of preventing junk leafleting. Well, look, thanks for your emails and WhatsApps. I thoroughly enjoyed those. Uh, we do read every single one. Oh, Ruth, I think it's time to go. Do you know, I have loved our rotating guests. I've loved oh, Aisha, the extra bits on a Tuesday. I, I, it's been brilliant fun. And elections are just mad, and this one's been madder than usual. But God, I miss Jess. I miss Jess too. And we actually, Jess, hopefully you'll listen to this, we're sort of planning to come to your hometown and maybe see if Tom will make us a cocktail yeah. post-election, if I get that far and I'm still alive. Remember, you can email us on electoraldysfunction at sky.uk or WhatsApp us on... 07934 We'll be back next Tuesday with our final episode before the election. And Jess is back with us next Friday. Bye. Woo. Yeah, Jess. <laughs> bye bye.